I'm Ballard Gardner, great-grandson of Archibald Gardner. On July 21st of this year, 1990, we held a reunion here of his posterity. About 2,000 people came from 44 states and four countries. During the program, this monument was unveiled and dedicated. His numerous lifetime accomplishments were reviewed. This is just one of many monuments that have been dedicated to the greatness of this man. He was one of the great pioneers of 1847. Few men in history have a posterity that look to an ancestor with such pride and respect as do the more than 20,000 descendants of Archibald Gardner. What a real tribute it is to Archibald Gardner to have a family gathering the size of this one. This is indeed a signal occasion. To begin the day, some have been up to the intermittent spring about six miles up Swift Creek Canyon and had a morning sunrise service. I understand there were close to 350 people there and it was a beautiful occasion. You know, I have often wished that I could turn time back about 100 years or 101 years and talk to Archibald Gardner and be able to ask him personally what it was like here when he came into this valley. You know, we don't often get that opportunity to talk to our ancestors. Gee, what, what's that buggy coming up the road? I haven't seen a buggy like that in a hundred years. Why, well, look at that team. You know, this makes him well over a hundred years, don't you? <laughs> Archibald Gardner, I just don't believe it. Go ahead. It's, uh... By the way, who are you? And who are all these people? And what in the world is going on here? Well, Archibald, grandfather, <laughs> I can't believe this. This is just a part of your posterity. These are your descendants, most of them, and some of them here are friends. They've come here to a family reunion to honor you and to dedicate a monument right here in your name. Why, we read in your patriarchal blessing a place that said, a posterity shall keep thy name in remembrance forever. And this monument will just help us do that. But I want, I've got some questions to ask you. I've been wanting to talk to you for 50 years. Can I ask you a few questions? But do you mean to tell me that all these people are descended from me? These and about uh, 20,000 more. Incredible. <laughs> I settled here for 11 years. And during that 11 years, I built five different mills and I assisted in establishing one woolen mill. Well, that's quite a feat uh, after all of the mills that you've built in Utah, but uh, what brought you into this valley? Well, son, when Congress passed the Edmonds-Tucker Act during the 1880s, it outlawed polygamy, as you know, and that made it very difficult for those of us who were polygamous. I found myself moving about to try and avoid being arrested. During the summer of uh, 1889, I had been sawing lumber in Woodruff, and uh, when we had finished our sawing project there, I took Brigham L., who was my nephew and uh, son-in-law, and we went over into Gentile Valley in Idaho to see if we could find a a good meal site there. We were not entirely satisfied with what we saw and so we decided to look further. In the meantime we had heard that Mormons were settling here in Star Valley and so we decided to come over here and take a look. And when we got here we liked very much what we saw. Well that's interesting and I'm glad you came here but this is a big valley. How did you decide on this location for a mill? Well, it was quite simple. We, uh, when we got here, we made contact with 
Bishop Kazar, Kazar, whatever, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we explained to him what our interests were in coming into the valley, and so he took us on a tour showing us the surrounding area. And when we got here and saw this beautiful canyon and the nice stream of water coming out of it, we knew we had found what we were looking for. And as Brother Brigham had said earlier, this is the place. Well, I'm glad this is the place, but what was it like? Could you describe what this valley or this town was like when you first got here? Well, as near as I can recall, there were about 61 families living in the valley at that time. They did have a log meeting house. They had a district school, and they even had a post office with a mail route connecting to Montpelier. However, they did not have a sawmill or a flour mill, and uh, I could see that that was something badly needed. And so when I told the settlers that of our plans to build these mills, uh, they were very excited and expressed a willingness to assist in establishing these two mills. Okay. Uh, I heard uh, that you had several families that were involved in coming into the valley. Could you tell me about them? I should add one thing further uh, before I get on to my families. When I explained to the uh, people what we had in mind, uh, we called a group of men together and I explained to them exactly what the project would entail. Uh, I reached in my pocket and I pulled out one lone $5 gold piece and I said, this is all the money I have, but if you're willing to work with me and trust me, uh, we will finish these projects and I will see that all of you are fully repaid. And they were willing to trust me and so we went to work. Now you ask about my families. Uh, since uh, Brigham Ale had been running the mill over in Woodruff, uh, after we got started with the project, uh, we, we had uh, the mill race and the frame for the mill under construction. I sent an outfit to Woodruff to bring the water-powered sawmill here. And uh, since Brigham Mail had been running it, he went back to Woodruff and uh, picked up his wife, uh, Mary, Lucy, or uh, Lucy Adele, Lucy Adele, excuse me, who uh, was also my daughter. Uh, and they brought their family here to the valley so they would be here to run the mills once they were completed. We had uh, provided in the flour mill for living quarters, and so Brig and Deli moved into these uh, living quarters, and for the first few months, I lived in the mill with them. So that was the first of my families to come into the valley. Then in uh, September of 1890, um, my son-in-law, William Turner, and my daughter, Mary Elizabeth, and their family came to the valley, and they homesteaded 160 acres of land at the mouth of Willow Creek, and that community became known as Turnerville. And so that was the second of my families to come here. Then about that same time, I had gone back to Salt Lake to visit friends and family there. And while there, I visited with President Woodruff, and he counseled me to bring, my, bring Mary, my 11th wife, and our seven children and make a permanent home up here in the valley, which we did. It was uh, a very tough uh, decision for Mary, as you can well imagine. She had just moved into a nice new home in Jordan, and it was tough for her to give that up. But after several days of discussing the matter, she finally agreed that that was the right thing to do. And so we loaded her household goods into a wagon uh, we left Jordan in the latter part of September, and we arrived here in the valley on October the 1st of 1890. Now, by this time, we had constructed a two-room log cabin, and uh, Brig and Deli and their family were occupying one room, and so Mary and our seven children and myself uh, occupied the other room. So that made the uh, third of our families that moved into this valley. Then in November of 1891, uh, Laura Althea 
and uh, her two youngest sons, Osro and Wallace, along with Joseph, his wife, and their children uh, came to the valley. And they spent about a year here, and then uh, uh, Laura decided that she was not meant to live in this valley, so she and Wallace, along with Joseph and their, uh, uh, his family, returned back to Jordan uh, while Osro stayed here, uh, took up land, and made this his permanent home. So that was the fourth of my families. Then, as best I can recall, my son Robert uh, moved into this valley around the turn of the century, making five families of mine that moved into here while or during my lifetime. Well, that explains why so many of your descendants are in this valley, and they live still in this valley from one end of it to the other, and a lot of other valleys in a lot of other states across the United States and into foreign countries. But I heard something, Grandfather, about your foresight in being able to see things that were needed. And I heard some story about uh, you uh, helping with provisions for the uh, the first winter you were here. Could you tell us about that? Well, uh, after we got the mills uh, running smoothly, everything going fine during the uh, summer of uh, 1890, I began to turn my attention to things outside of the mill. And in looking around the community, it became apparent to me that very few provisions were being made for the coming winter. Now, we had experienced a rather mild winter, the winter before, and uh, I guess the settlers thought it would be the same thing again. But to me, uh, two mild winters in a row didn't hardly seem logical, and I was greatly concerned. So I made a trip to back to Salt Lake. I visited uh, with President Woodruff and explained to him what I could see coming up here, and he agreed that something needed to be done. And so he advanced to me $500 with which I returned to Montpelier, and there I bought some flour, some wheat, and some corn, and uh, had it brought into the valley before winter set in so that the uh, mountain pass would not be blocked. And it's fortunate that we did, because that turned out to be a very harsh winter, uh, much snow, very cold weather. And in fact, the mountain pass uh, from here to Montpelier became impassable except on snowshoes. As a result of the hard winter, uh, hundreds of cattle starved to death. Uh, many families lost the only milk cow they had, and some families even resorted to taking the straw out of their mattresses to feed their only cow to uh, try and prevent the cow from dying. Now, no people uh, starved to death, fortunately, because we did have ample provisions for the people, and so we were mighty fortunate that uh, we had these provisions. There are many, many stories about your families and about your inspiration that we could talk about, and we'd like to keep you here all day. But I just have a couple of more questions that I've heard many people ask this morning. That is, just where did you build the mills here in Afton? Could you point that out to us? Well, uh, just standing here and looking towards the mountain, you see that old, uh, that white greenery up there next to the hill? Uh, that's about where we established the first sawmill, or the first flour mill, excuse me. And then uh, north of there, uh, we, we had the uh, sawmill, the planing mill, and the shingle mill uh, clustered together, uh, approximately where that house is. And then up on top of the bench, as you can see from here, we had a mill pond from which we uh, drew the water, uh, came through the uh, mill races that we built uh, into the mills to run both the shingle or the saw mills and the flour mill. Well, it turned out to be a good location because the mills ran with water power for many, many years. But you know, one question I've often been asked about Archibald Gardner, my great-grandfather, how did you have the ability to accomplish all that you did in your lifetime? 
Well, I could only answer that question by saying that this was a gift from my Heavenly Father with which I was born. It has always been easy for me to uh, look at a situation and think of ways that that situation could be improved. I guess my philosophy has always been that where there is a will, there is a way. It's been easy for me to, uh, for example, go into a canyon with, and uh, while riding through the canyon on a horse, uh, look and see where a, a road could be built through that canyon to make it easier to pass through. On the other hand, uh, I've been able to look at a valley and see where a canal could be built through that valley to bring life-giving water to the dry land. In fact, uh, the first time that I stood about in this location, clear back in 1889, I could almost see the mill standing up there in its location. Uh, in my mind, I could hear the hum of the machinery going, and I could even uh, smell the uh, dust from the flour as it was coming out of the mill. In short, I guess uh, in summary I would say that it was a blessing from, my, from the Lord for which I've been very grateful. Another thing, I guess in my favor, I was always blessed with good health and I was able to do a hard day's work and uh, never get tired. There were three things in my life that were very important to me, as you can imagine. First of all, being my family. And all of you beautiful people, I understand, are part of my family. Something I never dreamed that I would see. The next thing that was important, of course, was the church. Religion has always been an important part of my life, and uh, the, my church activity was uh, certainly important. And third was the opportunities I had to serve in the community. My life was always enjoyable because of the things that I was doing. Well, I appreciate that, and we've had you do quite a bit of talking, and before the day's over, I'm sure a lot of these people will want to ask you a lot more questions. But right now, we talk about this big posterity, though your life history bears out that you were a man of, uh, definitely a man of great vision. Your works prove that, and your posterity are proud of what you were, as evidenced by this gathering. But you know, Archibald, the record shows that you had 283 grandchildren. Now that's quite a number, but you know that about 40 of them are still alive today? Is that right? And it looks like there are 28 of Archibald's grandchildren that are present. They come from three of great-grandfather's wives, Sarah Jane, Laura Althea, and Mary Larson. There are, oh, excuse me, and Serena, I guess, the four of them, excuse me, appreciate that correction, and are from Serena. So there are living grandchildren from four of your wives or families, and I think after this many years, that is really something. Now, some of them that we would want to point out or introduce, your very youngest living granddaughter is also your very youngest living grandchild, Yvonne Gardner-Clark. Where is Yvonne? Big. <laughs> Yvonne, is it legal to tell your age? Yes. Yvonne is 62. Okay, the youngest living grandson is Gene Gardner, and he's 63. Gene, will you stand? <laughs> Now, let's have the uh, grandchildren from Laura Althea please stand. I believe we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, seven. Is that right? Will the children, the grandchildren of Laura Althea please stand? There's, there should be five of them. There's seven. Is there five here? Now, let's see if we get gotten the names. Is, oh, oh, right here, Mildred. So Irma, hold up your hand. E.O. Gardner, hold up your hand. Lloyd, Mildred, Laura, Laura Draney, Bonnie, and Irma Evans, is she here? Oh, that, she's here, okay. I got her on here twice. 
Irma, can I tell your age? She doesn't care. She's 88. And a half. And a half. Okay. Thank you. Will all the grandchildren from Serena please stand? We should have at least three of them here. Okay, we got Leonora. Hold up your hand. Turn around so the group can see you, too. Verda Tuckett. Rose Anderson. And Leonora, you're the oldest of those. Can I tell your age? I'm the oldest of these three. Oh, she's also 88. <laughs> so. Uh, Mary Larson, let's have her grandchildren please stand. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to go down through this quite quickly, so turn around so the group can see you. Now hold up your hand. Ma Marion Flugaker, Milford Gardner, Marion Arave, Marion Randall, Olive Thatcher, Mary Randall, thank you. I'm, uh, Howard Whittison, Margaret Vaughn, Ross Gardner, Milt Whittison, Kenneth Gardner, Lillian Despain, Marie Beecher, Arch Whittison. <laughs> well, let me make an explanation here. His given name is Archibald Gardner Whittison, so we've got the genuine here, <laughs> okay? Uh, Dawn Whittison, Donna Draper, Ruth Dawson, Jean Gardner, Yvonne Clark. Did I miss anybody? Have all of the children, grandchildren been introduced? Okay, you'll notice they're wearing these golden ribbons, and as you see them through the day, you'll know these are grandchildren of Archibald. Let's give them a big hand. Okay. Uh, I almost overlooked the the oldest ones in Mary Larson's family is Marion Flukiker and Milford Gardner. Do the two of you stand? And they're both 88 and a half. <laughs> yeah, there. So that means that we've got about four here that are 88 and a half, <laughs> and that's a real. That is a real tribute to you, Archibald Gardner. What a pleasure. Thank you. Just let me mention a few things that I think we need to remember about this great man. I know that a lot of the pioneers accomplished a lot, and he was among those who were the doers. One of the strong points of him was his spirituality. His faith in Christ and the restored gospel was the great motivating power of his life, and this faith has carried over into his posterity. His posterity have been serving missions in almost every mission of the church. One of the most important things that Archibald taught everyone to, is to be honest and true to the teachings of the Savior. His pride was that his family were all honest people. That was very important to him. Many account has been heard and will be told this afternoon about Archibald. Let me give you an example. Having enough faith to ask his Father in Heaven to stop a river flowing with ice out of Lake Huron into the St. Clair so that he could cross safely and escape from his enemies and the miraculous answer to that prayer that will be told this afternoon. Archibald Gardner served as a bishop for 34 years in the West Jordan Ward and he served all of those in whom he was the father of that ward. He was a builder. He is known as the pioneer builder of the West. Although we recognize the many mills that he built, and we know there are over 35, we think the count is 37, it could be more. He produced the first commercial lumber in Utah. He erected the second flower and mill uh, in Utah, and more mills than any other pioneer that we know of. He even built the first grist mill in Ontario, Canada. Mills were built at Warm Springs, Mill Creek, West Jordan, Big and Little Cottonwood Canyon, Spanish Fork, Pleasant Grove, American Fork, Camp Floyd, Leland, Peoria, Woodford, and five mills here in Star Valley and other locations. If I had to ride a horse between here and Utah, I don't think I could get two mills built, so that's quite an accomplishment. He said that his main work was building canals. 
And he built the first canals for irrigation and power out of the Jordan River, and he built many canals which are still in use today. Some of them have been enlarged. He built the first bridges across the Provo, the Spanish Fork, the Jordan, and the Big and Cottonwood rivers. And he also built many other bridges. One thing that Archibald Gardner made sure of was that every community that he lived in was a better community because he had lived there. And many of his descendants have tried to do the same thing. He did improve the conditions for the people and he cared for them. Archibald Gardner was a strong man. He was, had a lot of endurance. He, in his prime, he weighed 220 pounds. And he was known for his feats of strength and skill. He held the record in Canada for long distance foot racing. A Canadian neighbor, John Hamilton, one day proudly was exclaiming his dexterity with the use of an ax. I cannot chop you with one hand, said Archie. Ha ha, said Hamilton, let's see you do it. They selected trees of the same size and kind and went to work. Hamilton grabbed his ax and with both hands smote with might and main. Archie took his ax in one hand and with expert and telling blows, his tree fell first and John Hamilton is the one responsible for telling this story. When Archibald Gardner was in his 50th year, Neil, his son, challenged him to beat him home. They were 10 miles up Mill Creek. When they were within the sight of Mill Creek, Archie said, hurry up, Neil. If you're going home with me, I'm tired of poking along. He sped up and he left his son in the rear. Now at age 50, that's quite an accomplishment. There've been a lot of monuments built to Archibald Gardner. These will be included in the new book of his life. The new book will be like the old one, but things will be added to it. There's a monument in Canada on the Nor Nauvoo Road near Alvinston. The monument was dedicated at a special service held under the direction of Ezra Taft Benson in November, or excuse me, it was in 1946. Uh, and this is what was written on the Nauvoo Monument. The Nauvoo Road was constructed in, er, in uh, 1846, when Archibald Gardner, one of the first settlers in the area of Canada and builder of the first grist mill, led a large group of converts from Alvins to Nauvoo. The road was literally chopped through the forest by these Mormon converts and has been legally designated as the Nauvoo, Nauvoo Road since November 22, 1851. So he helped bring the Mormons out of Canada into Nauvoo by doing that. There's a large monument at West Jordan, just west of the largest grist mill that he built, located at 7800 South. The mill was built in 1853 and still stands today. Beautifully restored by Nancy Long as a gift shop in Archibald's restaurant. We'll learn more about that this afternoon. The monument's plaque says Gardner's Builders of the West. And I need to clarify that this was to Robert Gardner Sr. and Archibald's brothers as well as himself. There's one located at Mill Creek, and, uh, which is located at 36 South and Highland Drive. It is near the site of the mills that Archibald built there in the spring of 1848. It's how Mill Creek got its name. It's where the first commercial lumber was produced in Utah, and the gardeners received the first permit to leave the Pioneer Fort. There's a monument at Lake Pines, which is located at 48 South and 9th East in Salt Lake City. Wheat from all over the country was milled here. The two millstones are said to be the first factory-made French burrs brought to Utah, and Mr. Gardner sent to Chicago for them with a cost of $1,500 delivered to the site. The most recent monument is this one, which we're going to unveil in just a few moments. Located here in Afton, Wyoming, the monument is eight and a half feet tall. It's made of Georgia granite. It has a steel finish with an apex top, the shape which is fitting to a man who was looking onward and upward on a continual basis. And uh, you'll all get a chance to see the monument if it's crowded right after the program. Come back this afternoon, come back tomorrow, come back in 150 years, it'll still be here. We do want to... <laughs> Archibald's picture is on display in the Daughters of the Utah Pioneers Museum just west of the Capitol building in Salt Lake. There's also a plaque in the Sons of the Utah Pioneers building located at 33rd South and 29th East in Salt Lake. If there are other plaques and monuments that you know about that we don't have a record of, please send them in so that we can uh, put them in with the history. The, uh, just a few more comments and then we're going to dedicate the monument. I'm going to quote so what some other people said about Archibald Gardner. They said, blessed are the meek. And yet Archibald Gardner could take chastisement. 
His faith in the gospel was founded on the rock and nothing could affect it, even though the president of the church, Brigham Young, reprimanded him in a way that he thought was unjustified. Susan Young Gates, the daughter of Brigham Young, states that Brigham Young on some provocation rebuked a bishop before a public gathering. The bishop was Archibald Gardner. After the scathing reproof, Brigham Young said, now Bishop Gardner, I don't want you to apostatize because of what I have said. And Bishop Gardner stood up and in his strong stentorian tones, his voice could be heard two blocks away, replied, don't worry, Brother Brigham, this is my father's kingdom and I have just as much right in it as you have. And at this, the leader chuckled. <laughs> At a state conference held at Spanish Fork shortly before his death, he was called upon to speak and he bore a strong testimony of the divinity of the gospel and told them about his family of which he was so proud. He was a man that uh, took care of the poor and the needy and there are many accounts in his book of the things that he had done. One person said, I was entirely out of flour and had no money to buy any. My family was hungry. I'd been in the stores and tried to get it without success. I went to bed that night feeling very blue. There was no bread in the house for breakfast and no flour to make any. Next morning, to our wonder and joy, what should I find upon opening, opening the door and leaning against it but a sack of flour? There was no evidence as to who my benefactor was save the large footprints in the snow that led to the Gardner Mill. And these stories do go on and on. Uh, Brigham Young, one brief statement from Brigham Young. He said that it would take a mill yard the size of the moon to satisfy Archibald Gardner. And I thought that was interesting. He also said to Archibald Gardner that if he would build his mills and use them in the service of people, that he would never see the day that there would not be wheat in his bins. And as it said in the article in the Star Valley Independent, there was still wheat in the bins of this mill when it burned in 1955. The state conference was in session when news of, his reach was e er, news of his death was reached here. The Sunday afternoon session was held in his honor, and the entire time was taken by close friends and acquaintances who bore testimony of his sterling worth and their benefactor. It was an occasion of sorrow to everyone, and there were few dry eyes in the house. Every speaker praised him and thanked their Heavenly Father that they had known such a noble man. The state president at that name was George Osmond, and he stated this, no person that had ever entered Star Valley had done so much to assist its people to build up the country. His many and uh, good qualities were dwelled on, especially his charitable nature. Apostle John Henry Smith, one of the speakers, said, God never placed a truer man on earth. He compared to him as sturdy oak standing alone in a field. He had withstood the winds of adversity and had grown strong. He was a giant among men. He never betrayed his wives, his children, or his God. And I might state, as I close my remarks, that God gave us memories that we can have, so we can have roses in December. We all have many memories of Archibald Gardner and his families and descendants as we've moved on down. So we do pay tribute to the memory of that great man. We've got represented here behind us with another man who bears his name. Now, it's time to unveil the monument, but just before I do, I want to introduce the committee who has worked so hard, and I can't name all the people who have worked hard, there are so many, but some who have helped carry the lion's share of the load. I think most of you know that I'm Ballard Gardner, I'm the uh, reunion coordinator. Scott Gardner's behind me, please stand, Scott. He's the chairman. Lana Gardner-Warren, you've heard from her over and over again on the contribution. She's written all the receipts. V. Gardner-Hull, who you met earlier. Jill Crandall on the genealogy. Uh, there's two that aren't on the stand, Colleen and, uh, and Elaine Warren, who've worked hard on publicity. Where are you in the group? If you're here, stand up and holler. Oh, excuse me, did I, what did I say? It's Elaine, it's Elaine Horton. Jill, uh, Colleen Lunt and Elaine Horton. And there are many others who have contributed pictures and things and information which have been so important to us. Now we're going to unveil this monument. I think all of you know that granite was chosen because it is used extensively in monuments because it can be polished so smoothly 
It is so hard and does not damage easily. Carvings and inscriptions on granite withstand weather for centuries. Go ahead and be untying it, Dean and uh, Scott. And I might say that the inscriptions on the monuments are on the back of your program so that you can keep them in memory. Oh, before Scott and Dean, could you hold up for just about 30 seconds here? One more thing we wanted to mention, and it's probably one of the most important. I appreciate the committee keeping me on track here. Uh, Kim Gardner is reminded, we so much appreciate all of you who have contributed so generously to make this monument possible. It wouldn't be possible without you people and without the money that you put into it. We, it doesn't matter whether it was a dollar, a hundred dollars, or a thousand dollars. To some of you, even at five dollars could be a big sacrifice. It all went into the same project to make the monument and the reunion and the facilities here possible. And all of you see what you've come to see unveiled today. And those of us over here are looking at the back side of the monument which so fittingly has his wives and his children listed. And also a quote from his patriarchal blessing that a posterity would keep his name in remembrance forever. On the front side of it, you'll see it as you go around. The wording is on the back of your program and we feel it's a fitting tribute to Archibald Gardner. Now at this time, we we're going to have ask Mervyn Gardner to dedicate the monument. Our Father, which art in heaven. In this peaceful, quiet contentment, Know this, that every soul is free to choose his life <coughs> and what he'll be. For God's eternal truth is given that God will force no man to heaven. We pause this hour through the power of the Melchizedek priesthood in the valleys of the tops of the mountains to dedicate and hallow this ground and to dedicate our hearts and our minds with great love and honor to our progenitors. Archibald, a builder, a colonizer, a great exemplar who came 101 years ago to this valley in pursuant to freedom, to steadfastness, to a love of liberty, to a strong desire for justice, honor, with a vibrant abiding faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we might leave this place each time we pass, rededicating our lives to do those good things in the world. Grandpa Archie was large in stature with great physical prowess. He was large in heart. He was large in example. Yes, Father, we know he even made a mistake or two. We know that he did not get along perfectly with all. We know that he loved animals. We know that he loved the mountains. We know that he loved his family and friends. As we pause and dedicate our lives and dedicate this monument to his remembrance, let us remember he and those great women who served with him 
and those posterity who still are living and who have passed on, his great-grandson who has passed and will be honored this day, Delos, we remember him. And there are others who in service to mankind have passed in his posterity. May they as great pioneers and we as modern pioneers do that which is right. Serve, honor, and obey thee. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.